Tonight we'll go to the topic which I've carefully prepared and I believe the Lord has a word for someone here tonight. Amen. If you're that person, let me hear your loud amen. amen. I was pre- going on another course and the Lord said, no, this is what I want you to talk about. I said, okay, Lord. And I know anytime the Lord pulls me aside like that, there is somebody that he wants to bless. And if you are that person, let your amen be the loudest. Tonight we'll be looking at this topic titled, Does God Really Forget? Does God really forget? Ask that is a question. Ask me. Does God really forget? And our anchor scripture is the scripture for the month. Isaiah chapter 49, verses 15 to 16. And it says, Can a woman forget her sucking child, that she may not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hand. Thy weights Thy walls are continually before me. Now, brethren, I don't know if this has happened to you before. Maybe I'm the only one. There are certain times in your life that you seem forgotten. Has anybody ever been there before? Okay. Those times are called the silent moments. Your prayer doesn't seem to be answered. Say, oh Lord. Give me that card, give me that card. But the card, you know, just skips and then you don't get it. Things remain almost at the same spot. No matter what we do to get them going. And the question is, were we really forgotten at those times? God has an answer for someone. And I want you to be very attentive. This is something that will change your life forever. In the name of Jesus Christ. Because I've had many say it. Oh, it looks like God has forgotten me. God has forgotten me. I don't don't know. Nothing seems to be working. But I have an answer for you tonight. Now, if God does not forget, how come the scriptures say as follow? In Genesis 8.1, the Bible says, God remembered Noah and the animals. So if God remembered, then did he really forget? If God remembered Noah, did he forget them in the first place? Genesis chapter 19, verse 29. God remembered Abraham. So did he forget Abraham? Genesis chapter 30, verse 22. And God remembered Rachel. Did he forget Rachel? 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. God remembered Anna. Did God forget Anna? Exodus chapter 2, verse 24. God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he sent for the rescue of the children of Israel after 430 years. Did God forget them for 430 years? It's very easy to say no, no, no. But let's examine this scripture tonight and see where things are. Now, I want you and I to be assured, first of all, that the love God has for you and I, he compares it to the love that a mother has for her child. And I was doing a research about mother's instinct for their children. And New York Times came up, came up with a report that says a Japanese scientist, uh, scientific group did a study a while back and they put about 13 mothers, about 13 children from mothers in a room. They sealed up the room and then put the mothers in such a place where they can be looking at these children. What they were trying to test is the, the instinct of a mother for a child, does it have to be when they see or touch the child 
or even just from a distance, just observing the child, that instinct was working. And here's what they found. After the test, one of the, one, the test they did was they sealed up this place like, like a laboratory and put each of the children on each table. And then at some point, when the children were smiling, they couldn't hear the voice. So you don't know whether it's crying or smiling, but just looking at the face alone. So they put the student at a distance and put the mother in such a place where they can see them without any sound. So sometimes when those children were laughing, their mother will be smiling and you know, see the glow on their face. Now, at other times when those children were crying and were in distress, something was happening to the mother even though she could not hear their voice. They discovered that the, the, the now, they had, they had put some sensors in the brain of these mothers to sense what's going on in their brain as those children, they saw their own children in distress. Now, they found out that when other children were in distress, mother didn't really care. But if it was their own particular child, you saw they, they found in the brain of the mother that something was wrong. So, in other words, a mother's instinct is hardwired in the brain of the mother. So, and that's what God was comparing himself to. He said, can a mother forget a sucking child that she will not have compassion on the child of her womb? So, naturally speaking, mothers have a hardwired brain brain that tells them what is wrong at a point in the life of their children. And when those children are in distress, mother is in distress. So what God is saying is, any time you are in distress, I feel it. Any time something is going wrong with you, I feel it. I know it, that something is wrong. Now, I wonder why they didn't do such about fathers. I mean, they, when, when they were putting it together, I said, well, maybe someday we will do this about fathers. Why? There are runaway fathers. Fathers who really don't care. And there is, there is sometimes no connection between, you know, what's happening in a child's life and a father's. You know why? Because it's just wired in certain way. Praise God. So now that's who God was comparing himself with. The mother in whose brain there is something that is hardwired to know when the child is in distress and feel that pain. She may not be able to explain it, but somehow something in her is telling her, no, I don't understand there's a problem. And then they begin to pray or call the child or you know, whatever step they need to take. And then they go ahead and take those steps. Now, brethren, I have the word of the Lord for you. Whatever is going on in you or around you, in fact, greater than the pain or the stress you are going through, our Father God understands. He knows at that point where that pain is, what's going on. He has an idea and he understands it. That's why he compares himself to a mother who has the same feeling that the child is having and then moves into action. There are, there are several scriptures. But Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, for instance, tells us. It said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Think about that. I will never leave you or forsake you. In other words, no matter what's happening to you, I'm proud of you. No matter what is happening around you, I am proud of you. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only 
begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. So the love of God is so much so that whatever is going on in you and around you, he has an idea of what it is. And many more scriptures. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 42, Psalm 89, verse 34, my covenant will not, not break nor alter the things that have gone out of my mouth. So every promise in scripture that God has made about your life comes to pass. But the question is, does God really forget? Does God really forget? Now, what happens when we seem forgotten in those instances in life? If God does not forget, why are all my prayers not answered immediately that I spray them? Why am I allowed to go through certain circumstances in life? What is God looking at when I am going through some issues and I'm crying out loud and it's like, see, he's not hearing me. What's happening at that moment? And I'm, that's where we're going to, and I'm going to be making this explanation. And as you get these explanations tonight, the next time you are in that situation, you will know what to do. Amen. I was praying for someone. Amen. Now, brethren, I found out and I realized that every living Thing grows. Say that with me. Every living thing grows. One of the characteristics of a living thing is growth. Now, how does growth occur? How does growth occur? You have a boy, he's this size today. By the time you see him in two years, he's this tall. Do you observe and see him and say, oh, he's just grown by two inches. Oh, I saw him. He just shut up. No. Or of plants. And you say, oh, I planted this yesterday. It was just this much. But look at where it is right now. I saw it shoot up two inches. How many of us have seen that before? Now, do you know where growth occurs? In the dark. Write that down in your notes. Growth occurs in the dark. In the night season, when everybody is asleep, that's where the agent of growth goes and begins to make the thing grow. I remember when I was a little boy, I had uh, my immediate younger sister. While we were growing up, every time they asked me, and I hated those questions, who is older, the two of you? I know I'm older, but she was this, and I was here. And I, every time they ask me, who, oh, oh, I see the two of you, you are bro brothers and sisters. Who is older? I, I won't stop asking, can't you see me? I'm the big boy. You know, but something happened. As we were growing, she was here, I was here. After a while, I came here, and she was here. I've been here, and she's still there. <laughs> Praise God. Now, what am I saying? Every living thing grows, but growth does not occur in the light and before everyone. It occurs in the dark. And what do I mean by that? Psalm 90 verse 5. It says, Thou carriest them away as with a flood. They are as a sleep. They are what? As a sleep in the morning, they are like grass which grow up. So in other words, when men go to sleep in the dark, growth occurs. Growth occurs. It doesn't occur before the glare of everyone. Do you know that your spiritual growth does not occur with open face? It occurs in the dark seasons of your life. Your spiritual growth occurs in the dark seasons of your life. Now, these are alone moments when you learn to increase your dependency on God.
So those times that it looks like I am forgotten, I'm, where is God? And you begin to search. Where is God in all of this? Oh my God, where are you? Where are you? Those times growth is occurring. God is leaving you to understand what's around and show your dependency on him. Be a man. Quit like a man. I had, I was listening to the story of one young man yesterday and was talking about how his life was so messed up from the youth and he mentioned a particular case where his, you know, more like contemporaries began to bully him in high school. They bullied him and bullied him and bullied him so much that one day it, it was almost like their right to bully him. So they came to the house. Now at that time, he was living with the mother and the mother's boyfriend. So they came to the house and then they began, stood right in front of the house and began to shout his name. Stupid, you know, and they made, made mention of everything. So he doesn't seem like a coward. He came down. He went to them. And as soon as he got in there, they began a fight. They began to beat him up. So his mother's boyfriend saw him. And the mother wanted to run to go and say, no, 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 leave him. Let him be a man. Let him what? Be a man. In other words, let him stand to resist evil, face the issues of his life. Let him be alone. Let him, let him learn how to bring the best out of him and fight back and push back. Because if you help him at that point, you are killing him. And I've heard this about butterflies as well. A butterfly, one of the stages that a butterfly goes through, it's in that shell. Pardon me, I don't know whether it's lava or pupa or which stage, okay? I wasn't too good in biology and sciences. That's why I'm an accountant. However, so this stage is in the cocoon and it's trying to break the cocoon just to get out. Part of the growth process of the butterfly is as it pushes back and hard against that shell, it's strengthening its wings. Every pushback strengthens the, we, the, the, the wings of the butterfly. Now, assuming you help the butterfly at that point, you terminate its growth process. And you are not helping it. You are destroying a fundamental part of what should really make it come out and then fly all over the world. And I understand butterflies can fly from here to the U.S. That's where they go when it is uh, winter. Because where are they going to hide? All of those birds and animals, they go. Now, in other words, for the butterfly to be strong to fly, it needs to learn to stretch its wings. There are certain situations that, that look like dark moments where God puts you in and it takes away his eyes from you temporarily from the glare of everyone. What is he trying to do? He's trying to build in you dependence on him. He's trying to build inner strength in you. He's trying to build resilience. He's trying to make you stronger so that when you come out, you come out shining and flying. And that is somebody's story here in the name of Jesus Christ. So now, those times when it looks as if you are forgotten, those moments, dark moments, they are moments of growth, planned. They are what? Planned for you to grow, for you to learn, for you to be open. But you know what most people do? They open their mouth and cry, yeah, 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 like that little baby. Instead of shutting up, learning, coming from within and saying, Lord, I know this is for my good. Something is happening around me. Teach me. Open my eyes. That's why the psalmist said, Lord, let me know. Teach me that I may know. Teach me that I may know. Those are times when you need to cry out, Lord, Lord, whatever I need to learn in this, help me learn it now and get it. Do you know why? If you don't learn it then, you either become lame for life 
or you need to relearn it. And until you get it, you are not moving forward. So there are those dark moments in your life. And I'll show you quite a couple of examples in Scripture. 430 years of the slavery of the children of Israel in Egypt. What was it for? Everyone say growth. 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 You remember how many people went into Egypt? How many? 70. How could God take 70 people to go and possess the land of the Canaanites? How? So he left them in Egypt. Learn it. Grow. Grow. When they were coming out of Egypt, how many people came out? Three million. Not thousands. Three million people. 600,000 men alone. And let's assume they all have wives. That's 1.2 million. And let's say they all have three children each. Oh, that's already 3.6 million. So 1.2, 1.8 from so each person, let's say each person have one child and a half. <laughs> or two children. So they estimated that three million people came out of Egypt. From 70 to 3 million. Did God forget them? No. It was growing them. So there are those moments in your life when God is growing you. All you need to do is shut up, cooperate with God, and say, I know I'm not forgetting. I'm not forgetting. And like that woman who, in whose brain is hardwired the feeling of the children, that's exactly the same way that God feels for you. Exactly the same way that God feels. That's why he compared himself to the mother. Now, what about Joseph? Joseph, from the age of 17, he had a dream. Oh, I see the sun and the moon, they bow down for me. I see we're in the field and everybody's shield fell down and only my own stood up. And he had this powerful dream and he was telling, you know, the butcher was so bright. He said, one thing I love about God, he shows you what the end is and, he, and you are here at the beginning. The in-between years, you got to figure them out. And you got to depend on him for those in-between years. You got to depend on him for those in between years. So Joseph, between the age of 17 and the age of 30, were his growth years. They were his growth years. It was as if God took away his eyes. What happened to him then? His brother sold him. They took him, put him in the pit. That was not enough. They brought him out, sold him to slavery. In Potiphar's house, they lied against him. Wasn't God aware? No, he just allowed him. Go through this so that you can grow. So what you are going through now, if you are in those dark moments of your life, is a process of growth. Otherwise, you remain a baby for life. That's what I found. Otherwise, you remain a baby for life and every little thing, yeah, yeah. No, that's not what God wants for you. He wants you to grow up. And when you see situation, you can discern and say, okay, yeah, I can understand what's going on here. There is maturity. There is growth. There is total dependency on God. God loves to be depended on. God was? Loves to be depended on. I told you one morning, why, you know, for some days I've been so busy, I've not, you know, really had time to stay with him. And he woke me up about 4 a.m. And I, I took my book. The moment I sense that in my spirit, I have a journal. I just take my journal and go before him and say, Father, I've just come here to say thank you. I just want to worship you and praise you. He said, I only wanted to hug you. So God loves to be depended on. And that's why you need to learn it very quickly. What about Jesus? The silent years of Jesus. From the age of 12 when he could speak and you know he was interacting with lawyers to the age of 30. What was he doing? The silent years. Say growth. Say it out loud. Growth. 
the silent years of Jesus, a 12 to 30, he did nothing other than obey his parents, go to the temple, read and come back. Yet this is the savior of the world. He was God, became man, came down to the world. Yet he had to go through the same process. So who are you? That you're saying, no, I don't want to go through. Why is God forgetting me? Why is God forgiving? No, 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 no. I begin to cry. No. From this day, I decree that the hand of the Lord will come upon you. And he will instruct you. In the name of Jesus Christ. Do you know what I found about the growth process? That God designs? He designed it so so that we can become sons and no longer children. So that we can become what? Son. There is a difference between a son and a child. And I'll show us a couple of scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 6. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every... Scourgeth who? Underline that word. Every son whom he receiveth. Verse 7. If ye endure chastening, God... Delayed with you as what? As with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Verse 8. Let's read together. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So a bastard is somebody who doesn't want to go through any discipline. Don't discipline me. Just leave me. Go down. Just, 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 ah, ah, ah. <laughs> if ye be with child's chastisement, whereof all, say it's common to all. Say it out louder. It's common to all. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It said, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is what? Common to all. But God is faithful. And he will make a way of escape so that you can receive it. So, every time you go through issues, settle down first. Ask yourself the vital questions. What's going on here? Father, I want to say thank you. Because the first thing God expects you to do in everything is to do what? Give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Thank him for where you are and thank him for where he wants to take you to. And as you thank him, he begins to cause the door to open. The next time you are in that situation, I see God's hand come upon you. Yeah. Verse 11 of Hebrews 12. It said, Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, it yielded. Let's read that together. It yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So what you are going through, God says, is an exercise. The growth exercise. The growth what? Exercise. Which all are partakers of. But it does not yield until you go through it, until you are exercised by it. Onto your exercise. So those silent years, when it looks like, oh, I'm forgotten. When it looks like my prayers are not answered. God deliberately took away his eyes and introduced that dark moment in your life so that you can learn those vital lessons that you need to learn to grow up and then learn know how to resist the devil and push back hard against the devil. And I pray for someone here that God's hand will rest upon you mightily. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, what happens if we choose not to go through the growth exercise? I want to terminate it. No, 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 Lord, I don't, I don't understand. What happens if we, choose not to, if we choose not to go through the growth exercise? Galatians chapter 1, 4, verse 1 and 2. Galatians 4. Now, let's read this together. Now I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. Verse 2. But is under tutors 
and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So a child that is heir of everything remains a slave as long as he remains in that child. It's not different from a slave. So as long as you say, Lord, this is too hard for me, I don't want to go through it, God is saying you remain a child and you are not different from a slave. And how many slaves have inheritance? How many? None. None. Why? Because it's your purchase possession. You, you just pay for them. That was in those days when slavery was, was, was the order of the day. No, but you, you can't consider and say, okay, I want to leave all this inheritance to my slave. No, it's the son. Not just the child. The son. The son. The son who will stand up and say, no, my father's inheritance, no devil will come near it. And he's so full of zeal for the, for the father. And the father, before he calls, he says, yes, here am my son. Take over this business. Just go do this. Go do that. He says, yes, I'm done. And that son, will he get an inheritance or not? Yes. Sure. Sure, he will get an inheritance. So the Bible is saying, a child, even if he's heir of everything, that is, this is my only son, and he's the one who is going to inherit everything. As long as he remains a child, he's not different from a slave. So grow up. Say to your neighbor, grow up. Grow up. Grow up. And slaves don't have inheritance. Now, what do you do at those moments, those dark moments of your life? What do you do? Here's what the scripture says. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. Though he were a son, yet lent he obedience by the things which he what? Suffered. Verse 9. And being made perfect, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So, here is what it is. You are a son. You are going through that process of growth to take you there. All you need to do is, Lord, everything that I need to learn in this stage, teach me now. And as you learn it, the Bible says there is a process of perfection in that, in that your learning stage. As you learn, when you become perfect, dominion comes. When you become what? Perfect. In that process, dominion comes. There is an adage in the language, my original mother tongue, says, Uh, T Owo Omode Kobai T Kon Ikuda Kokimberi Ikutokpa Babai. Interpret, eh? When a child cannot hold a sword fully, he doesn't ask, What kind of death did my father die? Or who killed my father? Who killed my father? He has to wait until the time that he can hold full sword. And say, now, who killed my father? I need to know. So what that means is, until you are perfected in the process of your sonship, dominion is not in view. Until the process of your sonship is perfected. That's what the Bible says, even though he were a son, he was a son, yet lent he obedience by the things he suffered. And when he was made perfect, he became the author. Authors are born out of perfection. Authors are made when they are perfected. Authors are made when? When they are perfected. So always ask the Lord, Lord, perfect your will inside of me. Let your perfect will be done in me because that's when you become an author. That's when you become great. That's when you become a hero. That's when the world begins to look for you and celebrate you. So what to do at those times is to be quiet, is to learn. Know that you are growing. Don't terminate your growth process. Don't terminate your good growth process. Now, the question again is, does God really forget? Does God really forget? Now, here is what happens in those growth moments. God 
turns his attention away from you. God does what? He turns his attention away from you momentarily. My father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? La makta bak satani. La makta bak sani. Or how, whatever we say. Eli, Eli, la makta bak sani. My God, my God, why have thou what? Forsaken me. So, God temporarily turned away his gaze from Jesus at the time he was on the cross so that that growth that was going on, that work that was going on will be perfected. So, at those times that you are going through those dark moments, it's not as if you are forgotten, you are not forgotten. God temporarily moves his attention away and is focusing it on something else so that while you are learning and you are growing and you are saying, God, I need to understand what's going on here. And as you are doing that, he's growing you up. And after a while, he turns his attention back on you. So you are not forgotten. Say, I'm not forgotten. And how do I know this? I found this in scripture. In Genesis, Isaiah 49, 15 and 16. No, sorry. Genesis 8, 1 to 3. The message translation. Let's read this together. Then God turned his attention to Noah. And all the wild animals and farm animals with him on the ship. God caused the wind to blow and the flood waters began to go down. Verse 2. The underground springs were shut off. The windows of heaven closed and the rain quit. Verse 3. Inch by inch, the water lowered. After 150 days, the worst was over. Why? When God turned his attention, the worst went over. When God turned his attention, he closed the, the, the waters in heaven. When God turned his attention, he began to change things. Why? He left them temporarily. Not that he forgot them. He, he took away his attention. That's what that verse 1 said. And God turned his attention now. Do you know what's happening to you right now? God's attention is on you. God's attention is where? On you. What did he say about us this month? And God has remembered me. So what that means is God's attention has now turned on us at the joy overflow family. Now, and that's when things begin to happen. After God turned his attention on them, everything, the wind blew, the waters began to go down, everything, the worst went over. The worst season of your life is over. The best season of your life is yet ahead of you. And I decree God's hand shall rest mightily upon you. In the name of Jesus Christ. So what do you do at this moment? Seize it. Seize the moment. Lord, thank you for remembering me. This is the season. This is what I've been waiting for. And thank you because it is my set time for favor. Why? Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. He had made everything beautiful in his time. He had made everything beautiful in his time. It's turning around in your favor. Amen. Your life is beginning to move forward. Amen. God's attention is now focused on you. Amen. Whatever was not working before will begin to work now. Amen. You seem forgotten in the past, but right now his eyes are on you. The light bulbs have turned on and the glory of the Lord is resting upon you. Shall we rise on our feet tonight?